Mm, and now we have quorum. Uh, Councillor, are you ready to start the meeting? Yes. Uh, can you please wait for 10 seconds for our AV staff to start the YouTube live stream? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Kristen Wong Tam, and the clerks have confirmed that we have quorum. I'd like to call meeting 15 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee to order and welcome back everyone. This meeting is being held using the City of Toronto's WebEx technology with members and staff connecting by video conference or calling in. We ask for your patience with any delays and technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting on YouTube. We are also providing captioning for this meeting. A few reminders. To the city staff, please keep your video turned off until you need to speak or answer questions. This makes it easier for myself as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members participating in the debate on each item and during the votes. To the members as well as staff, please keep your microphones on mute unless you need to answer a question or to speak. Members, if you wish to speak on an item and if you wish to have your video on uh, and if you can, please raise your hand or unmute your microphone and let me know and I will begin to create a speaker's list. When voting, if you can have your micro video on, sorry, if you can have your video on and if you are able to raise your hand or unmute your microphone to indicate your vote. And if you have any motions on the agenda items, please submit them in writing to the clerk. The clerk staff are available to provide assistance by emailing them at taac at toronto.ca. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Toronto is now and has been home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I will now turn to the committee. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? And if you have any interest, please unmute your microphone and let me know. Okay. Uh, recognizing no members have declared any interest, uh, next, we will need a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting on February the 10th, 2011, 2012, 2011. I just moved this back a decade. Um, it's, a, it's a retro meeting. Our last meeting on February 10th, 2021 and February 25, 2021. Okay. I, thank you very much, Howard. Um, moved by Howard. All those in favor, please indicate your support. Uh, any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Let's proceed with the agenda. There are six items on today's agenda, and we'll consider the items according to their order. So the first item is the, t uh, is the chair's report, which I will hold and come back to. Uh, DI 15.2 is the Poverty Reduction Strategy Midterm uh, update and accessibility feedback. We do have a presentation with, for, uh, with staff, and I will proceed to hold that as well for the staff presentation. Moving along is uh, item number three, Parks Forestry Recreation Response to Safe Outdoor Programming and Updated Communications Methods, Accessible Recreation Programs on the web. Again, we will hold that item. Uh, there will be a staff presentation. Item number four on today's agenda is customer experience transformation, accessibility and customer service. We will hold this uh, item again uh, for staff presentation. Item number five is the active TO Midtown Temporary Com 
a complete street pilot. Accessibility feedback is required. We have a staff presentation. We look forward to that, and we will hold that for the staff presentation. Item number six is vacancy on the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, members, there's a letter from the interim city clerk for information, along with notes that there's an additional vacancy on the committee. Um, I believe that we could probably dispense with this uh, item uh, rather uh, quickly. Uh, members, do any of you at this point in time have any questions uh, for staff? Or are there any of you who wish to speak to the matter? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, I'd like to move that the item be received for information. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate your support. Any contrary-minded? Seeing none. Uh, thank you. That carries. Okay. So just coming back to the top of the agenda, so we've just received the order paper, um, is uh, the chair's report. Uh, recognizing that uh, the, uh, the paper copy or the, the digital copy has already been circulated, uh, I will go through this as quickly as possible because uh, you all have a copy on it. Uh, it's been a very short period of time since our last um, uh, uh, meeting and, and today, uh, so I, this uh, particular chair's report is, is much shorter. But I will highlight that um, since, uh, since January of this year, we are now actively recruiting some new committee members. Uh, of course, uh, we want to make sure that our committee uh, is, uh, is populated with, uh, with really extraordinary and competent uh, members as it has been. Historically, our committee has been well served uh, by uh, citizen members with subject matter expertise as well as lived experience, uh, and, uh, and the staff are actively uh, reviewing and selecting those members. I am also happy to, um, to share with you as, a, as an update is that uh, we will have those new uh, members uh, installed and serving and joining with us uh, by our June uh, meeting. I believe that's, uh, that's now been confirmed. Uh, many of you will recognize that we've already passed the 2021 City of Toronto operating budget. Uh, one of the items of particular interest uh, for the committee members is that there was uh, an amendment to the vehicle for higher accessibility uh, fund, and that fund has now been um, modified by 70 percent, uh, but it is, uh, it is still within the, uh, the uh, the quantum needed to ensure that we have more accessible vehicles uh, that will be in operation for, um, for those with living with disabilities. Uh, CAFE TO 2021 feedback, uh, you, uh, this committee, uh, provided a lot of rich feedback and content for the staff. Uh, the 2021 CAFE TO guidelines uh, is, uh, of course, uh, being uh, going through final refinements, uh, but I think that we can all anticipate that we'll see uh, a, a much more improved um, uh, CAFE TO program in 2021, especially as it pertains to its effect on people living with disabilities. And then finally, the ongoing issue around snow removal. Uh, many of you were, were here where we provided some support and feedback uh, to our, um, our city staff with respect to overnight snow clearing and commercial properties. Uh, I won't rehash the, uh, uh, the, the outcome, uh, but uh, I think the, the general response was uh, leave it as is, it's working fine. Okay, so that is the chair's report. I want to thank you for that. Um, moving along to item number two, I'd like to welcome Wayne. Ch oh, oh, sorry. I need to move to receive this item for information. Thank you very much, um, Michelle. I see you moving this item for for receipt. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. Thank you, members. Item number two. Um, the 2019-2022 Poverty Reduction Strategy Midterm um, Update. I'd like to welcome Wayne Chu uh, to provide us with his presentation. Thank you. Um, so let me give me a moment while I share my screen. So good morning. Uh, thank you for. Uh, having me uh, once again to this committee. Um, as the uh, as the councillor indicated, my name is Wayne Chu. I am the manager of the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office in the city's Social Development, Finance and Administration Division. I'm here today to provide you with a midterm status update on the Poverty Reduction Strategy um, in advance of our a regularly scheduled update report to the June 1st Executive Committee. So, 
to provide uh, context for those uh, who are unfamiliar with the poverty reduction strategy. The poverty reduction strategy is the city's long term 20 year strategy to address immediate needs, create pathways to prosperity and drive systemic change across six themes that have been identified uh, through a uh, process of engagement, research, um, and uh, an assessment of best practices. They are housing stability, service access, transportation equity, food access, quality jobs, and livable incomes, and systemic change. Across these six themes, there are 17 recommendations that we are focusing on until the end of the strategy in 2035. Because this is a long term strategy for each term of council staff prepare an action plan to advance work on poverty reduction. We are currently in the 2nd action plan of the poverty reduction strategy. The 2019 to 2022 poverty reduction strategy action plan contains 89 activities to be carried out by the end of this term of council. So, as I indicated. In my opening remarks, we are currently in the midterm update cycle. Um, as in previous uh, in the previous action plan, staff uh, provide a regularly scheduled update to the executive committee, and our next update is scheduled on June 1st. And as part of our commitment to continuous engagement. Through this presentation, we are giving uh, you the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, as well as the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee later this month, the opportunity to provide early feedback uh, in the update process. As indicated, all of the feedback we collect through this committee, the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, and uh, our uh, external engagement um, outside the, uh, the Council Committee process will inform the June 1st report to Executive Committee. So we're right now currently collecting status updates from division on all of the 89 activities. Um, so I may not have answers to all of your questions that you may have, but through this process, we will uh, make sure to note those questions and we'll endeavor to make sure you get the answers that you need uh, in the uh, council report on June 1st and through uh, any communication uh, that is required uh, to you directly. So so for the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to run through um, the themes of the strategy and provide a uh, quick uh, summary of highlights, uh, things that we are focusing on, uh, that we anticipate focusing on in the June 1st report. And at the conclusion of this presentation, I will also give you an update on the Fair Pass Transit Discount Program um, as you requested uh, in the fall. So for housing, Actions are um, being carried out through the city's housing TO 2020 to 2030 action plan, which was adopted by council in December of 2019. The housing TO strategy sets out 13 key strategic actions, uh, strategic directions, my apologies, and 76 specific actions and updates on housing TO are provided regularly to the planning and housing committee. Uh, by the Housing Secretariat, formerly known as the Affordable Housing Office, um, and as they have carriage of that strategy, uh, I won't be uh, speaking specifically to housing, uh, but any, um, any questions regarding housing can be directed to the Housing Secretariat. Mm -hmm. On service access, the key message is that we are still um, responding to the needs of community in this current pandemic. So in partnership with community based organizations, the city of Toronto continues to provide modified safe community services and emergency supports for vulnerable residents during the pandemic in line with the required public health measures. This includes coordinating with community agencies and 211 to connect residents with mental health supports during these trying times. Um, so from April 27th, 2020, when the program was initiated to February 26th, there were 14,251 calls for referrals to mental health supports um, with an average wait time of approximately 44 seconds. So residents are being connected fairly quickly through the 211 contact center. 
Um, in addition, there have been 116,490 mental health support contact sessions through this program. More broadly, the pandemic has um, ha has required us to develop robust community coordination structures. And through the co community coordination plan, we have gained engaged over 400 community agencies, which is serving as a good practice for um, municipal community coordination, even beyond this current public health crisis. The next theme is food access. Through this pandemic as well, uh, a lot of the focus on food access has been on providing emergency food supports and coordination as part of the overall COVID-19 emergency responses. For the city, uh, that uh, includes facilitating a food access coordination table, but also uh, funding uh, and coordinating a food hamper delivery program, which is implemented by Red Cross. As of March 5th, 49,093 food hampers have been delivered to residents who are physically and socially and or socially isolated and who are unable to access other food security supports that exist in the community. I did want to note a couple of policies and reports coming up as we are currently in a transition period for food security work and food policy at the City of Toronto. Uh, upcoming at the April 12th meeting of the Board of Health is a report on black food sovereignty. And then on June 14th, we are going forward with a report again to the Board of Health on food access responses, food systems transformation, and the Toronto food strategy. The next theme is quality jobs and livable incomes. Um, as you can imagine, a significant amount of the city operations on quality jobs and livable incomes and income support uh, occurs through our mandate to administer the social security system. Um, but the other piece here that I wanted to highlight is that for the poverty reduction strategy, we are also focused on identifying, modeling, and scaling up initiatives that drive inclusive local economic development and create equitable economic opportunities for residents. This includes the Community Benefits Framework and on January 26th, uh, 27th, City Council adopted the Advancing Community Benefits Framework report that included recommendations that will strengthen the city's ability to implement the, the Community Benefits Framework, which includes inclusive hiring and social procurement objectives for city led projects. In addition, in the 2021 operating budget that was adopted in February, there were resources included that enable, will enable us to scale up our efforts. And finally, the city has secured external funding to advance work to improve equitable access to public sector procurement opportunities um, for both city projects as well as. Um, uh, uh, opportunities through Toronto's public sector anchor institutions, such as universities, colleges, and other government agencies operating in Toronto. For systemic change, a key priority for the poverty reduction strategy is to enhance and ensure continuous engagement of residents in decision making. Uh, one of our key initiatives in that regard is the lived experience advisory group, which is our resident advisory that uh, includes residents with lived experience of poverty. So we are currently uh, on the second cohort. Uh, so the cohorts of the league, uh, as we like to call it, um, are um, timed with each action plan. So. Um, the first cohort has concluded their work and we are now we have recruited a second cohort to provide an idea of who is uh, um, who has been engaged through the lived experience advisory group. Um, I did want to provide some demographic information that we have of applications. 323 residents applied to join the league. 35% of those applicants self identified as a person with a disability. Um, in addition, 37% identified challenges resulting from issues related to mental health. 
21% identified challenges resulting from issues related to physical disability. 30% also reported relying on income from the Ontario Disability Support Program. We have uh, a final group of 18 members, which includes strong representation from residents that identify as having a disability. Uh, and we will be um, having our first meeting of this cohort uh, in the next uh, month or two, um, once we finalize um, meeting details. Members are being provided with technology supports to enable virtual engagement as we are unable to meet in person. We did intend to meet uh, have our first meeting with the lived experience advisory group last year, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we were unable to start that until this year. So for the remainder of the presentation, I want to talk about fair pass uh, as requested by council and fair pass. The fair pass transit discount program is a key priority for the poverty reduction strategy. Uh, to um, provide some context fair pass provides a $1 10 cent discount on single rides on the TTC and a $32 75 cent discount on monthly passes. It is currently the only um, trans low income transit discount program in the region that provides a discount on single rides as opposed to just monthly passes. So, as you are aware, due to COVID-19 emergency redeployments and responses, we had to suspend New applications to the Fair Pass Transit Discount Program last year um, uh, in late spring. Renewals for existing clients did continue to be processed automatically. And also, as also indicated in our staff report to Council in November, through the fall of 2020, staff worked to implement new back end improvements that are less vulnerable to disruption and. Uh, thankfully, on December 15th, through the hard work of our colleagues in the Human Service Integration Application Support Center and the Human Service Integration Office, we began accepting new applications to Fair Pass um, on that date. Eligible residents are able to apply online at toronto.ca slash transit discount. Previously, this uh, applications were a paper-based process, and so we did not have an online application form. For residents who are unable to utilize the online application form, they are also able to apply by contacting the Human Service Integration Application Support Center at the number on your screen, 416-338-8888, and selecting option six. Since the restart of new applications on December 15th to March 8th, uh, which is when we uh, finalized this presentation, a total of 1,023 applications were processed. 41 of all applications received since December 15th were for active Ontario Disability Support Program clients. In terms of ridership, we do continue to see a lower ridership which we attribute to the uh, uh, physical distancing uh, measures and uh, the lower ridership that is being experienced across the TTC generally. Um, in 2020, the average number of single-use rides per month was 242,677 trips, which is about 65% of the annual monthly ridership from 2019. In terms of next steps, uh, we will be beginning an evaluation of the current phase two of the program this spring. So the implementation of Fair Pass is occurring in phases. Phase one opened up the discount to those in receipt of social assistance. The second phase the, uh, opened up eligibility to low income residents who are in receipt of child care subsidy supports. In this year, we are hoping to complete implementation of phase two by extending eligibility to those receiving housing supports. And work is currently underway to develop processes to do eligibility checks, valid applications, and all the other back end processes that are required to roll that next phase out. 
And we, finally, we are continuing to collaborate with partners such as the Toronto Public Library to provide free Presto cards to anyone who needs them because we do recognize the cost of a Presto card is a barrier. So that is the high, high level update. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that the community may have right now. And uh, if you have any questions at any time, please reach out to us um, at the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office and we would be happy to chat. And with that, uh, thank you. Uh, Wayne, thank you very much for your presentation and, and uh, for making it so uh, succinct. Um, I want to just make sure I can see the members on the screen. Thank you. Uh, for members with questions of staff uh, on their presentation, starting with Wendy. Go ahead, Wendy. You'll have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for your presentation. Can everybody hear me okay? I've been having some technology issues. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder, Wayne, if we could talk through a little bit more in detail where people with disabilities sit in the context of the presentation that you provided. So I have a hard time seeing our population represented and as the Accessibility Advisory Committee, this is you know who we're here representing. So I have some specific questions for you. Um, one of them is, you talked about a few reports that the city was working on in terms of food security. Uh, has the city conducted any reports on food security that relates specifically to people with disabilities. Um, secondly, do we do we know how many people with disabilities in the city of Toronto live in poverty? Is that a number that we have anywhere? And thirdly, I just wonder how do we know that the the initiatives that you've described in your presentation are having a direct impact on reducing poverty for people with disabilities in the city of Toronto? So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, thank you for your question. Wayne, we just lost you. We lost your video and your microphone is not on. Can you hear me now? Uh, if you can speak up a little bit louder, I think we could hear you more Sorry. clearly. Yeah. Okay. Can you, uh, is this all right? Can you hear me now? Yes. I just switched over to my phone. Okay. Uh, even louder is better. So hopefully. Okay. I will try. I will speak uh, very loud. Okay. Um, so I believe I heard uh, most of your questions. Uh, and thank you for that. So with regards to food security, um, so to my knowledge, we have not done a focused um, piece of research on food security as it relates to um, residents with disabilities. Um, I am aware that some analysis has been undertaken um, on that on that uh, through in community. However, the city has not done a focused analysis of that. Um, we are currently in, as I indicated, in a transition phase where Toronto Public Health, which has traditional carriage of the food security file, um, has been um, completely focused on the public health response right now. And so the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office is now starting to take on a little bit more of the work. So in that regard, um, the, uh, that is something I think a lens that we would like to take as we assess how, what next steps we um, undertake for food security. Um, and so um, that point is well taken. The second question, has the city conducted research uh, or analysis on how poverty relates to people with disabilities? Um, I don't know, I don't have the, uh, the numbers in front of me, but we do know uh, uh, that uh, people with disabilities are disproportionately experiencing poverty relative to um, the general population and other communities. So that is very top of mind as we assess our activities and as we assess uh, and evaluate all of the our actions and our activities, um, that is a lens we intend on taking. Um, and then I didn't, uh, so I actually I didn't catch the last question. Can you repeat the last question? Sure, it's specifically, how do we know? Because we heard a lot about an, a number of initiatives, I think today, um, but where do we, how, do, how does the city know? And therefore, how do we know as a committee that these initiatives are having a direct impact on reducing poverty of people with disabilities? Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that we're trying to implement in the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office is a robust monitoring and evaluation um, um, 
framework and infrastructure. So part of, to answer your question, part, the first part of that question is identifying, okay, what are the actual outcomes we are trying to address? And so one of the advancements from the first action plan was in the second action plan, which is what we're currently in, we have actually identified specific outcomes that we are trying to achieve. Uh, and those are laid out in the 2019 council report. So the second um, step then will be to collect um, data and, and collect and uh, gather indicators that will allow us to understand whether we've actually made a difference on those outcomes. And through the city's overall work on disaggregated data collection, we do want to make sure that we are able to report on those indicators um, across dem different demographic groups, including uh, people uh, identifying with a disability. So that is something that we plan to embed in our monitoring and evaluation uh, roll up as we assess the, the efficacy of this action plan when we develop the next action plan. Can I ask a couple of, of follow up questions? Go ahead, Wendy. So do you just in terms of the numbers, because we're what we're finding through the pandemic, frankly, Wayne, is that we don't have any numbers around people with disabilities and it's impacted the community in a very dramatic way. And so I, I just want to clarify, does the city of Toronto have numbers today on the number of people in the city uh, who live with a disability who are living in poverty? And also, it sounds to me like there's an intention to do some data collection around disability in the context of the strategy, but has that started? I guess those are the two questions. Yeah, um, we don't have good numbers to be perfectly frank. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, City Council recently adopted the data for equity strategy to try to enhance the city's capacity to collect that uh, data. So it's not an ideal situation. Certainly it um, is problematic for the poverty reduction office, not for us not to have good access to good data. And, but I do think the city recognizes this as an issue that needs to be addressed. And that's why there is uh, the data for equity strategy and in the 2021 budget uh, funding to establish a disaggregated data unit in the city to actually focus on the problem. Thank you very much. Um, Wendy, I, I'm sure you recognize I let you run your run the clock a little bit just because I think you were asking some pretty important questions, uh, but also the fact that we have a shorter agenda today. Um, are there any other members with questions of staff? Okay. Um, seeing none, I'm just going to start my own clock. And Bhuvani, I can't see you on the screen, so uh, just unmute yourself if you do have questions and we'll write, make sure we recognize you. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to restart, restart my own clock. Um, so, Wayne, with respect to the, the issues that Wendy has just brought up, which I think are very, very current and very important here, um, if, if we're not collecting good information and, and good data to inform the policy work, uh, and you're about to, to finish up this, this particular piece and, and move into a new action plan, how do you ensure that people living with disabilities are not going to just be left behind? I think the important piece there is um, the way we evaluate the strategy is first on the data and you know, I've indicated the, um, the issues that we're trying to address. The second component of that is to ensure continuous engagement with residents. So if we're not getting sort of the empirical or quantitative data, that at least we're ensuring that we're getting the, the feedback from residents on a continuous basis to um, to get a sort of qualitative sense of how things are going on the ground, as it were. Um, so, you know, we do our best to try to gather as you know, much information as we can, whether it's through community organizations, through resident engagement, through the lived experience advisory group, and the existing data sets that, that may exist. For example, we can look at, um, at we can look at what's going on with, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, folks accessing the shelter system, for example, or folks 
um, uh, you know, who are accessing other uh, community supports and see if there are sort of proxies to that. And I don't want to get into a technical conversation about how we could try to get that. But um, I think the, the short answer is we do our best uh, recognizing the information gap but recognizing as well that we have to do more to establish some basic infrastructure at the city so that this is not as hard of a, a ch not as hard of a problem to address and it's something we could uh, easily report on on an ongoing basis. Okay. Thank you. That would be helpful. I think it would be helpful for this committee to see that the themselves reflected ourselves reflected in your work. Um, so, Wayne, I'm just going to ask a, a few questions about the fair pass because I think that's um, that's that's a pretty critical component. Uh, obviously, it's had some start and stops. Uh, hasn't been the smoothest rollout. Um, the the feasibility of in-person registra registration and um, you know, not everyone is going to be able to get online. And I think that there are some who who may want to apply in person or have some face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, what what, what would it take for us to, to, to bring forward in-person registration for the, uh, the FAIR Pass program while following public health protocols? Um, what I would say right now is because given the current phase where uh, eligibility is tied to um, uh, participation in a specific program, um, in-person registration would probably work best through the existing uh, structure. So, for example, someone on social assistance um, uh, working with their caseworker uh, in their check-in to do that. So, some you know what often happens, uh, and it's uh, which is a uh, completely appropriate process, is for someone to provide assistance to, uh, to a resident to go online and apply. Um, the next question then is that when we um, you know, if and when we get to the final phase of Fair Pass, which is where we would like to extend the eligibility to anyone in, in Toronto who is low income, uh, then we have to uh, explore how to uh, integrate the um, integrate applications to Fair Pass. You know, through other counter services. So the, the you know we don't have any firm answers on that. Our principle that guides us, however, is sort of a no wrong door approach that um, that we don't want to create sort of another office for someone to go to to apply. We would like prefer to have people apply for this program through existing channels that they are already using. And so is the intention to then ensure that the means supported tests be much broader than what it is today? Uh, perhaps including those who receive um, uh, rent subsidies, uh, but to but to ensure that uh, it's 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 one full uh, bucket of qualifications and there's one point of contact. Someone can check off the boxes that apply to themselves and then just um, uh, basically be automatically approved. Like is is that that's, where you want to get to? That's the hope, and actually, that's the excitement with uh, moving the administration of the Fair Pass program into our uh, Human Service Integration Office. Um, and recently, we actually, the Social Development Finance and Administration Division, has uh, recently uh, taken carriage of the Human Service Integration Office as well. The 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 mandate of that. Uh, that office and that project is to do uh, what you just indicated, Councillor, which is to provide coordinated, consolidated application and support to residents who are accessing human services at the city. So again, the sort of no wrong door approach that you shouldn't have to continuously prove that you're poor is, you know, sort of what it has is the feedback we often get from residents and we wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, and so that is the guiding principle for us. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Wayne, for the answers. Uh, any other members with questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, members to speak. Okay, uh, Wendy, please go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you, Wayne, for the presentation, but I, I really would, I would really appreciate a presentation, I think, from the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office that, uh, as Councillor Wong Tam said, I think very, well, that reflects us, 
that people with disabilities on this committee and people who are here representing people with disabilities could see where we sit in terms of uh, the data that's available to the city and the data that you're working with around measuring the efficacy of the, uh, the initiatives that the office has undertaken. And I know you were talking a little bit about proxies there and things like that. I, I don't doubt for a second that people with disabilities live in poverty. I am extremely aware of that through the work that we do at CELT, as are the community members, the committee members that are here today. The question I have is why doesn't the city know that? Why can't we actually point to data within the city that says clearly uh, this is a community of people who live at or below the poverty line and are dramatically underemployed uh, and you know that the initiatives that the city has spent quite a lot of time and money on rolling out are making a difference for the community. I don't think we can see any of those things. We don't have a clear sense of who, who is out there that has a disability that's living in poverty. We don't know whether they're engaging with the initiatives that you've described or not. And we don't know whether any of those initiatives are actually impacting um, them living in poverty. And so I, I, I would like to request, and perhaps I can work with, I, I should have done this already to work on a motion, but I would like the, the uh, Poverty Reduction Strategy Office to come back and provide us with another presentation that actually says clearly what the data sets are uh, what do you know about people with disabilities and what do you need to know and what the plans are for addressing those gaps in data. Okay. Councillor Wontem, I probably should have drafted a motion <laughs> on that. Uh, not apologies. a problem, Wendy. Um, if you want to, if you can, maybe start off with a, a little draft on your own, send it along to us, and we can also hold down this item until you're ready to move it. Um, so I think that's something we can do over the next uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, I'll uh, do that. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, anyone else to speak? Okay, uh, I do have a motion and uh, unfortunately it doesn't capture the, the good sentiments that Wendy just spoke about, but we are gonna tie it all together. Uh, my motion is specifically, and I will ask the clerk to put this on the screen, uh, the motion is specifically regarding the Fair Pass program. Um, and the recommendation is that City Council request the Toronto Transit Commission Board to request the CEO of TTC to explore the feasibility of improving access to the Fair Pass program in consultation with the par City's Poverty Reduction um, Strategy Office and to expedite any ongoing work, including but not limited to, ex to explore the feasibility of in-person registration in accordance with public health guidelines expedite extending the Fair Pass program to residents who already receive other means-tested supports, such as rent geared to income housing, and explore the feasibility of mailing uh, program-validated Presto cards to, to facilitate and ensure access, and to report back to, the tr to TAC on the results of this review by the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, and, uh, and I just want to recognize that, you know, Wayne, thank you very much for your report. Um, I think, you know, the frustration that perhaps you were hearing from, uh, from I won't speak for Wendy, but I'm, I think there is a level of frustration at this committee, uh, largely because um, even though the city does not have necessarily great uh, disaggregated data, and I do recognize that we haven't started that work, it's still very early days. But unfortunately, the, the information that we do have already points even if it is um, aggregated. It already points to the fact that people living with dis disabilities are disproportionately uh, impacted by uh, poverty. Institutionally, individually, government, state sanction, uh, failed programs, everyone is falling through the cracks. And because COVID has made things that much more difficult, uh, we're seeing the, the, the swelling of numbers now of people with disabilities who are further uh, marginalized and further uh, vulnerable than ever before. Which means that your work and the work of uh, the, the poverty reduction uh, team becomes that much more important. So we're going to push you a little bit harder, and I think that that is—I uh, I suspect it's going to be welcomed by your division, anyways, because I know you folks are are are, are keen and and. and and deeply committed to the work. But I think that because of what is already happening in the community, what we know our, uh, our, our, our system fails, we're gonna all have to dig deeper and, and do that much more. Um, so I'm gonna hold this item down while we, uh, so Wayne, stick around. I'm gonna hold this item down while we sort through the uh, uh, another motion, uh, but we will definitely come back to it after we deal with uh, item number three. Okay, so um, if there's no more speakers on this, we'll come back um, at that time.
Okay, so moving along to item number three. Item number three is uh, Parks Forestry Recreation Response to Safe Outdoor Programming and Updated Communication Methods. Um, and we have a presentation uh, today from Howie Dayton as well as Angela Lopez. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, Howie, you're on mute. There you go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hi, hi there. I'm unmuted. Still getting used to this uh, WebEx. Hope everyone is well, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, I think somebody is going to be working the slides, but I'm not sure who that somebody is. Is that Angela? Are you uh, sharing the screen? I can. I will. Um, I thank thought you. Jennifer was going to put it up first, but I can definitely do that. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Um, so happy to uh, be here to present to the committee today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Angela. Uh, we're here to respond to two um, uh, motions to come back to uh, the advisory committee. Uh, I'm going to speak on the first one, which was 15.14 related to the provision of outdoor programming for persons living with disabilities and employment uh, opportunities. And then Angela will um, speak to the second item, which was related to communication. Next slide, please. So just as um, a, a reminder to the committee in terms of the uh, four service uh, areas that PFNR provides in the provision of recreation programming, for persons living with disabilities. Um, the first uh, is inclusive support, meaning we have additional staff uh, or volunteers available to assist somebody who has an identified need um, to be able to more successfully uh, integrate into a, a program, uh, whether it's a summer camp, an aquatic program, uh, any type of instructional recreation program, and that support is available for uh, anyone of all age. We also have accessible equipment available. Um, we provide tools, resources, and training for staff. And with the COVID response, uh, we created in the summer of 2020, virtual programming uh, that we uh, deployed last summer and have continued to deliver. Next slide, please. Uh, we've had an extended uh, service impact, as you know, as a result of the changing health guidelines um, that have really restricted our ability to deliver much of our traditional in-person programming. And the division has really innovated to ensure that we've been able to provide uh, whatever services have been safe to do so. Um, specifically for persons living with disability, uh, the team created a virtual suite of programming uh, that we made available last summer and have continued to offer through the fall and winter. Uh, to date, we've offered about 80 hours of virtual programming to 200 participants since uh, over our winter session. Um, and we have a virtual camp planned for the spring break in mid-April, uh, which is already full with 22 participants. And we're looking to see if there's ways we can expand that should there be waiting lists and additional demand. We're also hoping to deliver in-person programming this spring um, and are looking to pilot a number of outdoor adopted programming, which I'll describe in the next slide. Um, as soon as provincial guidelines allow for these programs uh, to resume. And I'd also like to point out that we just completed a very successful Welcome to Winter uh, program in the city, uh, which was very focused on uh, the use of the city's 54 outdoor rinks. And as it relates to persons living with disability, we made available and had uh, health and safety guidelines established to enable skate aids and sledges as examples uh, to be used, and they were very well used over the course of the winter. All told, we had about 800,000 visits to our 54 rinks with reduced capacity, making it a very safe experience for everyone. 
Um, the committee may recall that we established policies, uh, I think it was about two years ago, uh, to permit wheel wheelchairs on the ice. Um, and we were able to sustain that op opportunity this year, uh, which also helped open up skating options uh, for many individuals who were previously not able to do so. Outside of the recreation piece, I will also say that uh, the Welcome to Winter plan included expanded access to winter pathways, which were cleared uh, in our park system, um, and access to uh, seasonal park, uh, rink, outdoor rink, and community center washroom facilities um, to make sure that um, persons living with disabilities, as well as other vulnerable populations, had access to uh, washroom facilities in community, uh, given how uh, closed off those were in retail set environments. Next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, what's ahead, um, and I won't go into a ton of detail on this, um, we're currently in the gray uh, zone, but I'm sure everyone is hearing, as I'm hearing, there's some pending announcements today, so we're not sure what that's gonna mean. But as it stands right now, we have 10 community centers open for uh, persons with, living with disabilities who require physical therapy. To date, we've had approximately 170 visits. Primarily, people are using those centers for the fitness amenities that they have in order to engage in continued physical therapy. So those provincial guidelines changed um, last month or the month before uh, to enable our centers to open for that purpose. Uh, we have camp programming, as I mentioned, planned for uh, in-person camp programming planned for the week of April 12th. Um, however, we are waiting on today's announcement to see if that's going to be impacted. If it is, uh, we will continue to deliver the virtual programming. If we move to the red zone at any point in the spring period, uh, which typically goes from mid-April till June, uh, we are looking at, as, as I said, at piloting some outdoor park-based uh, social and fitness programming specific for persons living with disability. Um, and also uh, providing a, a inclusive support uh, should we be able to resume any traditional recreation programming, for example, aquatic-based programming, but we're unsure at this point if those will be able to resume. And as we look ahead to summer, uh, we're contemplating a number of pilot initiatives in our park system this summer, um, as well as a continued delivery of our Camp TO program summer in the six program and parks play to program and making sure those programs are inclusive for persons living with disability be it having extra staff to provide one-on-one -on -one support um, but the enhanced service level i would say that we're looking at is a range of programming uh, that include uh, adapted movement science in the park art in the park art and story time programming jumbo tennis uh, giving you some examples of some of the creative programs that we will uh, provide uh, for our adopted participants uh, in the park system, again, based on whatever the provincial orders are as we head into the July of 2021. Um, and finally, we are planning on uh, reopening our outdoor pools, and those will continue to provide accessible aquatic opportunities in the outdoor aquatic uh, environments, although we're not um, likely to be able to restart instructional aquatic programming just yet. Next slide, please. Just really quickly, I think it's really just important to note that that all of these programs are, are very structured uh, against the health and safety guidelines established by the province, Toronto Public Health, and the way that they operate, um, and uh, specific to uh, ensuring the health and safety of persons living with disabilities, um, we've uh, really established and work with the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Disability Steering Committee uh, to design these programs, to help locate these programs so they're uh, geographic, geographically equitable, um, as well as um, programmatically appropriate for the types of needs that uh, we think we uh, will need to respond to. Um, and this slide just gives you a sense of what some of those uh, considerations are going into the locating, planning, and uh, health guidelines that are established in these programs delivery. So we're hoping that we can deploy them um, over the summer, and we're going to uh, do so as soon as uh, we get the green light from the province and Toronto Public Health. 
Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it to Angela to uh, talk about the communication piece. Thank you. Thank you. In response to the Economic and Community Development Committee recommended that the City Council direct the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation in collaboration with the Chief Communication Officer to update the City of Toronto website to include all city recreation programs operating through the COVID-19 pandemic, indicating which programs are accessible and communicate changes through all appropriate city channels and report back to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee in the first quarter of 2021. So many pages on Toronto.ca feature recreation information, including accessibility features, for example, the Parks and Recreation Facility listing with a map and list of view of various centers, amenities, and program details listed on individual recreation center pages. This also provides information on the buildings, so the community recreation programming centers. Accessible recreation facilities and equipment, facilities open for physical therapy, skating, swimming pools, winter washrooms in parks and recreation facilities and maintained pathways, washrooms available during winter and spring, including hours, type and accessibility, as well as paths that are cleared of snow in winter. The accessible recreation page provides programming updates and, access, and accessing adapted and inclusive services. A new way to play recreation during COVID, um, provides safety protocols during COVID-19. CAMTO page for upcoming spring break and summer programs, outdoor recreation programs, free neighborhood drop-in programs for children and youth, such as parks, play TO, and summer in the six. And these pages are updated as information changes. Supporting documents and outreach. So documents for improving service delivery for people with disabilities listed online on the accessible customer service guide, getting services right for Torontonians with disabilities. Outreach avenues include social media, maintaining communication with clients and families, monitoring of adapted and inclusive hotline, share opportunities with members of the adapted and inclusive municipal reference group, the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Disability Steering Committee and other local agencies such as Pegasus, All in Blue Review, Community Living Toronto. Um, and there's always ongoing communication with families via email and phone calls um, and all of our media outlet, all of our media opportunities. Future state, future web page updates. Um, with regards to the beaches, we're looking to update the pages to identify accessible beach ramp locations with pictures. For playgrounds, identifying accessible equipment and surface material for the playgrounds and trails, listing accessible information and features about those trails. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much, Angela, and thank you, uh, Howie, for your presentation. I will just turn it over to the committee members. Are there any members of the committee with questions of the staff presentation so far? No, seeing none? Okay. Um, I have just one quick question. I'll start my clock here. Um, so with respect to the rollout of uh, the, the, the rec programs this summer um, and also the fact that the, the variance in the COVID transmission is changing from what seems to be day to day, um, are you, um, is PFR able to, to make those quick uh, pivots uh, if the protocols uh, and the lockdown zones change one more time? Uh, but uh, through you, uh, um, I would say yes. Uh, we've we've certainly been able to pivot um, quickly over the course of the year uh, through our restart uh, plans as well as our cancellation plan. So you know the Camp TO model was a two-week uh, pivot in terms of the entire camp program. Um, so we are attuned to uh, the health guidelines. We're prepared to make those changes. Uh, deliver whatever services we can in the safest way possible, but also uh, cancel those services if we need to. And I'd say building up our capacity on the virtual platforms has really helped keep us connected to clients, especially our more vulnerable uh, clients, to make sure that they have some connectivity, sense of community, and uh, service programming available. Uh, 
Okay, uh, Howie, thank you. And so with respect to those uh, individuals who may have registered for specific programs, the ones that do have to, to, to register, um, and, and for, for those who are living with disabilities, um, do, is the intention to have everybody then re-register um, once the programs reopen, or do they stay on the existing registration list uh, and their, their spot is held until the program re it reopens? Unfortunately, the way it works is if they've uh, paid a fee, for example, uh, we, we would actually cancel, issue a refund so they're not out of pocket. Um, and then it's basically a brand new program that we have to start and uh, folks have to re-register for because we're not sure what the program's gonna be, what the fee is, and, and when it's going to uh, take place so that that has been a system. I know Angela's team does a lot of outreach to our uh, adopted and inclusive uh, participants just to help them uh, navigate those processes um, as seamlessly as possible. Uh, thank you, Howie. And I, and I guess um, can there be special considerations made for people living with disabilities? So therefore. If they register, I mean, when they register, they obviously, um, uh, you know, may have paid a fee, but the registration process is in. Uh, can you keep them in the front of the line? Because it does take time to, to, to get to the front of the line, so therefore they're not bounced off again. Even if after you put the refund in, but you go back to them saying, you are, you know, priority access uh, participant number two, would you like to come back um, when we reopen in, for example, September? Is that a possibility? I'm going to let Angela answer just in terms of how we approach the adopted and inclusive participants specifically. So we've always followed um, an equitable process in the sense, like how we mentioned, if, if fees are paid, um, participants are withdrawn and refunds are provided. Um, however, as soon as programs reopen, um, or anything changes, we immediately contact all of our clients and let them know when the registration is going to happen, how we can support that registration process. And we always double check and cross reference the past list to the current registration list to ensure that anybody that was previously registered has gotten registered into the programs um, as they restart. And at that point, we have the opportunity to look at if there is a wait list, what we can do to try to um, eliminate that wait list. So ensuring that people do get a position within a program that they're trying to look for. Uh, Angela, thank you very much. That is helpful. Not exactly what I'm looking for, but I can see that you're 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 considering the the, the population and making sure that folks can stay in the queue. Um, Okay, that's that's it from me for questions. Anyone to speak? Okay, uh, Howard, go ahead, please. Uh, what are the plans to open up the islands for this coming summer? Okay, so that's a question. Go ahead, uh, to Howie or Angela. I'll, I'll, I'll answer um, through the chair. Uh, we are planning at this point to, to well, the islands are, are currently open, so we never closed the islands. The ferries are operating. Uh, they will operate in accordance with Transport Canada's guidelines, which do call for reduced capacity. Um, and uh, what activities or infrastructures open on the island will be dependent on the health guidelines at the time. So that that I can't comment on yet, but the green spaces certainly will be available uh, for, for uh, residents to access. Howard, do you have a follow-up question? No, that's good, enough. thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Michael, I recognize your hand, and then followed by Glenn. Michael, first, please. Hi, good morning. Um, I would like to ask about how you're planning to address employment inequality for the gifts and perhaps the lack of experience of people with disabilities applying for jobs compared to their counterparts. Uh, through the chair, I'm going to ask Angela to talk a little bit about some of our leadership development programs and uh, employment opportunities that 
um, exist. I will say just just broadly that uh, you know we we have a fairly robust uh, employment outreach recruitment process. We make effort to reach out to uh, populations that you know may may be challenged to navigate our employment application process. Give them the tools that they need to help apply for jobs, as well as um, reducing some of the barriers to certification, pre-certification. So we, we are really working hard to level the playing field uh, for a number of populations that experience marginalization and vulnerability. Um, and then um, part of our leadership development programs that we've been um, implementing for our uh, persons living with disability are really intending to support uh, those individuals gain the experience um, through our training um, so that they're most ready for those camp jobs, for example, when uh, when they open up. But I'll, I'll ask Angela maybe to add any specific initiatives that she can speak to. Thank you. So when we are going through our hiring process, we are Angela, your screen just froze. I'm sorry, I can't hear and you. We, we just also lost your audio, you Angela. Audio uh, Angela, we just lost your vis visual, but if you can speak, uh, maybe we can still hear you. We see you again. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes much hear better. You. Thank you. Okay, I've connected to my mobile now. Um, sorry, so I was just saying that once we do hire on the staff, they do go through extensive training to learn about various disabilities um, and some of the disabilities that we most frequently see within uh, community recreation. And then we go through and we do extensive training on understanding the different components that come with the various disabilities so that we're making sure that they have a lot of background information. We work with organizations and agencies who will come in and help provide some of those training pieces and through lived experiences um, of some of our participants and our staff, they're able to add in addition to that training. Um, like how we mentioned through some of our leadership programs, we do provide a um, CIT program, so a counselor and training program for people with disabilities. And in that program, we try to help build their skills for employment, um, not only for parks, forestry and recreation, but employment that they might be seeking outside. And, you know, in hopes that we are able to operate that um, this summer with the guidelines in place and thinking of some virtual possibilities to offer those um, pieces as well to continue that work that we do to enhance and build those skills. So um, those are some of the pieces, but definitely it starts from the first application process. So the screening process and, and trying to um, find people with the experience, then through our extensive training. And then we continue that training as they are in the field and as they are working and they have lots of support from our um, senior part-time team as well as our full-time staff team and then we have like i said our leadership opportunities for those with disabilities and those without disabilities who are looking to work with people who have disabilities so i hope that helps answer your question um it sort of answers my question but i still have a question um i i need more time on the clock Kristen. um don't don't worry about so the clock for now. I and Howard are applying for a job. Um, Howard has five other jobs. Has had five other jobs, but because I have a disability, this is my first job. I need to understand how you would address that. Um, just hypothetically, because when people have a disability, this may be the first job that they apply for. So how can they have enough experience to be considered without being written off the first part? If, if I could answer that uh, through the chair, Michael, that's a great question. And, and, you know, one of the things that I will say about recreation uh, jobs and camps, the, these are 
often the first jobs for many of our uh, staff. These are young people typically who haven't worked before. Um, they're starting out as waiting pool attendants. They're starting out at the age of 14. They're starting out as camp leaders. So we, we provide them the experience. We provide them the training, and this is often their first point of employment. Um, I think what we're trying to do, though, is through however we assess uh, the skills and the abilities of individuals to take those jobs, because often they are providing supervision for other young children or vulnerable individuals. We just want to make sure that they've got some some basic skills, um, but we really build on those skills in the training. What we want to make sure is the assessment process doesn't disadvantage anybody in the way that we're asking questions and doing the interview, and that we're giving anybody who hasn't had a job really the confidence to go through that process, answer our simple questions, and 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 um, and be successful in that, and then consider. Uh, what some of the needs are of persons living with disabilities is to make sure that if there's accommodations required in that assessment process, we're, we're providing that accommodation so that we're not uh, further disadvantaging them. Not, that's what I mean by leveling the playing field, but these aren't the kinds of jobs that require a whole bunch of experience in order to get some of them, like if you're going to be an aquatic instructor, you may need different certifications um, for the safety of the, of that uh, kind of uh, program, uh, but many of our programs really are entry level, uh, no experience required jobs. Um, thank you very much for answering that. Um, I trust that you will make a safe space for people with disabilities applying, and I would just ask that you have a robust feedback mechanism for um, everyone who goes through the process, just in case they don't succeed, they can learn from the process, because at least they have a process. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank Next you. person to question is Glenn. Um, hello, this is, I suppose, just a clarification question. Um, when Angela was uh, going through the slides, one of the later ones was about upcoming changes um, to the Toronto.ca website, like uh, beach accessibility and so on. I think that was perhaps the very last slide. Um, is there a timeline for those sorts of things uh, to be added to the website? Just are we talking this summer in time for the beach season if we're allowed to, you know, be in those spaces? That's, that's it, just clarification of timeline for that coming soon. Can I ask Angela to take that question? With regards to the beaches update, um, I do believe that we can have that information updated this summer. Um, really the biggest weight on that piece is just making sure that um, everything was set up properly so we could put the ramps out safely um, and then take those pictures to ensure that um, we have the right setup and the right pictures to go online. So that piece should be up for this summer um, or any information pertaining to the ramps. So, you know, um, like I said, we're keeping the information updated regularly. So if there's any um, maintenance required on the ramps and things like that, the hope is that we're keeping that information updated regularly so people can go on before heading out to the beach and knowing of that information. Thanks. I appreciate that answer. I'm just sometimes coming soon can mean, you know, this summer, as you've indicated, or it might mean hopefully maybe in the next five years. So I just like to clarify. Uh, thank you so much, Glenn. Any other members with questions? Okay, seeing none, members to, who wish to speak. Uh, seeing none, I just want to recognize and say thank you to staff. I'll move to receive the, the, the uh, staff presentation uh, for information. 
I, I do, of course, I think we all do, uh, the, every single committee member is aware that, uh, that staff have worked very hard, especially within PFR. There's been much that has been asked of you during the pandemic, especially as the, the, uh, the virus ebbs and, and flows. Um, and I have, you know, to be quite honest, I've been very impressed with how hard you folks have worked, but also how quickly you've adapted. Um, and, uh, and all of this trying to stay on, on top of the, the, the existing uh, direction from council to, to make sure that recreation is accessible for all as a, as a foundational piece to build upon. Um, it has not been an easy year, and, uh, and certainly uh, your efforts have not gone unnoticed. Uh, so please accept uh, my thanks and the gratitude of this committee uh, for all your ongoing work and make sure that as you move forward, uh, please keep in mind in your hearts and in the policy and in the service delivery, uh, the people uh, with disabilities and their unique service needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to move back to item number two as promised. Wendy has a motion that she is, I believe, ready to place onto the screen if the clerks can give her a hand. Um, Wendy, you have the floor. I have just sent back a, a slightly tweaked version of the of the motion. So um, to Carol and Jennifer. Okay. Okay. Uh, they are they are putting it all together for you, Wendy. Uh, maybe while Thank they you. while they put it on the screen and get ready to put it on the screen, maybe you can start to speak to it. Um, and maybe start by uh, perhaps reading it. Sure, so let me just grab it. Um, the intention is just to have a better understanding of what the, the data is that the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office and the city have available related to poverty of people with disabilities in the city and to ask about next steps for addressing any data gaps that they have identified. Uh, so it reads that the, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee recommends that one, the Manager Poverty Reduction Strategy Office report to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee by the end of 2021 on the specific data the city has indicating how many people with disabilities are living in poverty in the city of Toronto, the data that is needed to have an understanding of how poverty impacts people with disabilities, and the impact of the poverty reduction strategy initiatives on reducing poverty in this population. And next steps, the poverty reduction strategy office will take to integrate the collection of disability data into their data collection strategy, including a timeline for activities to address any disability data gaps identified. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, does, does that conclude your remarks? Uh, it does. I just I think that it's important. I think we've had a few um, we've had a few presentations from the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office, and I don't doubt that they're doing extremely important work. I just really feel that we need a better way of seeing people with disabilities in this strategy if we are to be upholding our mandate as a committee and representing the best interests of people with disability in the city. Okay. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, any questions? What's going on? on? I'm, Michael, do you have a question of the mover? Any questions of the mover? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate your support. Any contrary minded? No? Okay, that carries. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to head to item number four. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you to the clerks for that fast work. Uh, item number four is... Oh, so, <laughs> actually, Mike, the clerks are saying don't run away because apparently I have my own motion that hasn't been voted on. So um, we can probably put that back on the screen. Uh, and of course, just as a jog reminder, that my motion was all related to the Fair Pass program. Uh, I won't speak to it again because I've already spoken to it. All those in favor, uh, indicate your support. Any oppose, uh, that carries. Thank you very much. Okay. So now I can safely move on to item number four, uh, customer experience transformation accessibility in customer service. Uh, welcome today, uh, Robbie Grenwall uh, from Corporate Services, uh, who will be providing us with a presentation. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Robbie Grenwall. I'm uh, the Director of Strategic Planning and Policy in, in the city's Corporate Services section. Um, we do have a few slides that we'll be going through, so I'm going to see if I can bring them up right now. 
Um, should be coming up in a moment. And you can let me know if this is the full screen mode or the, the notes mode. It's Jennifer Carroll. So I want to make sure I'm in the right mode for the committee. Uh, just, we, yeah, there, that's perfect. We have the, your full slide on All the right. screen. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. So apologies for that. Um, so, Councilor, um, again, um, this is the, 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 the the customer experience um, transformation program. And I would be remiss not to kind of introduce some of my, my colleagues as well. We have a model in our program. It's um, if it takes a village. And so um, also here today is um, Gary York, who's the director and head of 311 Toronto, uh, Asim Hussein, um, who is the director and leading customer experience and innovation. Uh, we also have uh, Marco Palermo and Alice Zhu, who are from our technology services division, as well as Stephanie DeAdder, who's been leading our, our, the counters work for the city. So the purpose of us being here today, and it's actually our first opportunity to kind of engage this committee, is that there's a request for our program uh, to come and to speak about the program, including any current and future initiatives uh, related to people with disabilities. Um, before we kind of jump in, I wanted to make sure, like I, I know when PFNR comes to this table, it's very, it's very easy to understand what PFNR does. But what is, what is customer experience transformation and what do we do? So I just want to kind of give you a quick snapshot. So we are, we are a multifunctional team. Um, that is essentially focused on improving customer service and customer experience at the city. And so the way we, the way we sort of approach this is kind of four fundamental ways. Two of the ways are uh, the public don't necessarily see. It's really about making sure that we are, we are now taking a more of an integrated corporate approach with higher level standards. Uh, the second piece is making sure that we're putting the foundational pieces in place for sort so like tech technology so that we can actually enable um, the improvements that we're seeking. And so if you think about a car, those are the components like under the hood. The pieces that I think the public do see is a lot of the efforts in terms of the digitized services. So um, during COVID, um, uh, as we had to shut down our facilities in, in, to the public. Um, there's a rapid sort of shift to, to digital sort of services. So our team kind of works with divisions on that. And also this last piece is our channels. And so channels meaning um, how the public interacts with the city. If that is, you know, via a laptop and doing it online and self-service or if that is picking up the phone, right, and calling 3-1 Toronto, or if that was kind of previously kind of walking into one of our civic centers and, and, and get receiving in-person service. So that is essentially what we do. And, uh, and I also want to make sure that we kind of uh, uh, acknowledge uh, some recommendations from the Toronto Office of Recovery and Report, um, Recovery and Rebuild Report from September 2020. And I think there's, there's four key recommendations that I, I feel that kind of connect to the work that we do and will kind of resonate through the, through the themes of the, of the presentation. And the first is to making it easier for vulnerable people and community groups in using city-owned spaces. Uh, the second recommendation is on facilitating innovations and accessibility by playing a convening role between technology industry and disability organizations, enabling new partnerships and new sources of funding for the cultural disability community. Uh, the third recommendation is really about continuing with the significant business process redesign efforts and making city services more digitally capable and streamline the city's customer interface. And the last one is about more formal engagement strategy, including clear roles and responsibilities, increased capacity for ongoing and meaningful engagement with, 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 with many groups, including the indigenous communities, black Trentonians, equity seeking and vulnerable communities, um, and being transparent with, with, with the data and the findings. So, I will start um, at first principles. We thought like, uh, this is our, our, our first opportunity to present to this committee, and we want to start right from the beginning. So the city does have a customer experience vision, and so that is that the city will improve the lives of its residents, businesses, and visitors by providing simple, reliable, and connected services that anticipate changing customer needs. And along with that vision, there are five principles for the customer experience transformation program. And the first is to present as a one Toronto to the public. So that means to provide a one-stop shop for the public, ensuring a consistent look and feel across our services through common branding, minimizing handoffs, and enabling internal collaboration. The second principle is offer seamless and accessible customer experience across channels. And number three is to create simple, efficient, and easy to navigate processes. And so for two and three, simply what we're trying to do is to connect, to connect the public to the services they want 
and lead efficiently, effectively, with care, so they lead with a good experience. Principle number four is really about being accountable. So what we want to do is build trust and confidence with the public in the city services through increasing the reliability of our service delivery. And number five is really about flexibility to customize our services um, and, and really be adaptable. So, you know, during COVID, that, that was a really good example where the city will deliver high quality, sustainable services through leveraging technology and adapting strategically to invest in kind of higher value service activity. And so ultimately, Accessibility is essential to all of this. And so it's really about creating experiences that are accessible by design and really moving beyond the AODA standards. And so that's something that we are committed to. Go to the next slide. So I think we also want to talk about redefining engagement with citizens and services. So the traditional government service experience um, is the public interacting with different city services individually and having a different experience with each, right? So that can be, you know, engaging with public health, right? Or, you know, signing up for a recreation program or paying for a property tax or, you know, uh, applying for a business license and so forth. And so a lot of the, a lot of the services um, are there, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the components are there, but the experiences are very different and are inconsistent. And so the city has done a good job in terms of service delivery, all the foundational pieces are there. So when we think about digital, well, um, a majority of services have been digitized. So. Due to COVID, we underwent, underwent rapid digitization and essentially 92% of our, our, our servers are really being delivered remotely. With respect to in-person, we had, we had a full network of, of counters. So imagine we had 73 counters across our seven civic centers, right? And they operated independently by 23 plus divisions, right? And they all had some sort of different hours, queuing systems, um, and different processes. And then, of course, we have our contact center, very popular 311 Toronto, right, which is, which is a main access point for, for the public. And, of course, divisions have other sort of uh, specific call centers for more specific sort of services. So, however, what our program is really focused on is enhancing customer experience, okay, drive integration and higher corporate standards rather than the inconsistency and traditional fragmentation sort of approach and leveraging next generation digital opportunities similar to other services we all receive in our day-to-day -day lives from banking you know, to online groceries, to even to Netflix, to Amazon, or to even the bricks and mortar sort of retail that have embraced accessibility, open space, and personal engagement. So our program is focused on, on, a, on the future government model, one that has a consistent customer-centric experience vision with a customer interacting with the city via their chosen channel which is connected to multiple integrated services, right? And so channel examples are mobile, can be computer, in-person, or picking up the phone. And so we're gonna spend the next few slides to kind of give you a glimpse into that, into, into the opportunities the city has in front of it. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll start with the in-person experience. And so the current challenges of in-person experience are, I think, are, are quite apparent. So there's a burden on the public to find appropriate counters and transport to it. There are often long lineups, which proves to be difficult for people with mobility devices or a, a walker or cane. Uh, it's difficult to navigate wayfinding and signage, and there's dim lighting in some areas, also causing barriers for those with visual impairments. Uh, counters are standing height and are not accessible for all mobility devices. The city does have an AODA capital program, which is going to address all that over in the next couple of years. But currently, there, there is some um, uh, accessibility issues. And of course, there's limited, uh, limited accessible washrooms and amenities like hospitality. So there is a clear desire and opportunity for the city to create a more welcoming and inclusive customer-centric space. And so what that really means is, is like, there's an opportunity here to unlock space and re rededicate our ground floors of our key civic centers to public service and civic engagement. Imagine, if from a service perspective, imagine a singular hub, a singular hub model for the public to uh, receive desired service at each civic center. And they include like a tiered customer service areas with concierge to, gu to guide the public in the right direction. There would be clear white wayfinding and signage with consistency across our buildings to simplify navigation. And of course, we want to improve accessibility, self-service options, and the queuing and waiting experience. So on the slide and in the package that you receive in advance, you'll see uh, a future city hall concept. And I'll, I'll give you a little, little detail about this. In the early parts of 2020, we had competitively procured um, the services of a, a, a local architectural company called um, Dow Hastings. And we were gonna work with them in terms of kind of actually reimagining, coming up with a new concept of the first floor of city hall. And as we started that process, COVID hit. 
And so uh, in, in our process, we're, we're actually going to take, try to take a very thoughtful and meaningful approach in terms of, um, you know, engaging our local, uh, our internal divisions and staff, right, uh, formally kind of uh, engage with council, and of course, kind of do some uh, public consultations via digital and actually in person within our, within City Hall itself and how to sort of display and, and interact with people um, in the building. And so during COVID, we had to kind of pause um, the, 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 council, the formal council sort of uh, engagement and the public engagement. And so what we did do is just to kind of, just kind of move this along, we did engage with the divisions and we did sort of, sort of collate a lot of the public sort of consultations that had previously where there were key findings about customer experience, the in-person experience. And so what we were able to find is that there's, you know, we were able to kind of come up with a concept, which is, again, I would call this, you know, concept 0, 0.0. This is, this is just a, um, a, a, a schematic in terms of what we, we want to eventually kind of bring to to to, to council and, and the public for their their thoughts, but it's really about creating an open floor plan, you know, with reduced visual obstructions and barriers to hence flow and movement between spaces, clear bit and varied modes of wayfinding and signage, expanded and more comfortable waiting areas, including at the dedicated wheel trans area and in, in the north part of the building at the Hagerman entrance, uh, increased lighting, including natural light for easier navigation. Um, increased number of accessible washrooms throughout the floor, so including 14 accessible and three universal. Uh, quiet room for personal needs, including relief from overstimulation from sound, light, and movement. Uh, modular and adaptable furniture, including sit and stand desks that is for all mobility devices. And then large pro private, we call them tier two offices. These are these, this is when, uh, in terms of service engagement, if it requires more one on one interaction, then we'll have larger tier two offices to sort of man manage noise, adjust light, and have capacity for service animals and care attendants. And so, if you see the schematic, I know it's a bunch of calls, but what we really wanted to do is, and if you've been if you've been to City Hall, you'll see that there's a lot there's a lot of counters, and I think there's a lot of administ staff administrative spaces. And what we wanted to do is liberate that space. And bring and give it back to the public, either in the form of providing services or in terms of engagement. And so this plan here definitely has a service component in an integrated fashion. But this this model actually includes a lot more uh, space for engagement in terms of meeting rooms, in terms of opportunities to um, uh, uh, display sort of uh, from our, our, our archives uh, from from the tourism area. And so there's a lot of different components here that we're bringing back to the public. And really, this this concept. Is more than the service. It's really about placemaking, right? It's really about creating an inclusive area for civic activity, and that's what we're hoping that we're going to be able to do into the future. So again, it's just it's just a concept, and it's something that we'll be continually working on. However, first things first, though, um, we are in the middle of COVID, and our team from a from an in-person experience, uh, we are first now focusing on planning efforts around the eventual return to work of staff and the public reentry to the city. And so, although planning for reopening is underway. Please note that building reentry will be gradual, phased, and in accordance with public health direction to ensure the health and safety of our staff and public. However, we are kind of gathering information and we'll be working with relevant divisions to kind of develop recommendations, identifying you know, which counter services should reopen in person, how, and the when, right? And so we want to be proactive about this. And so in terms of this, imagine our next three to six months, it's very much going to be focused on the reopening of our facilities. And then we're hoping once that happens, we can then flip back and start start really focusing on the integrated hub model and kind of the future sort of experience of our facilities. I'll move on to the next area in terms of the digital experience. So I want to be careful when we, when we describe this. Robbie, I think. Robbie, I apologize yeah, for, I, I really apologize for interrupting. If you can slow down a little bit, uh, in your speech, sure. um, just because I know that our captioner is doing the very best that they can, uh, but uh, okay. it, it would just help her, I suspect, uh, a bit if you can slow it down. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. So we can now move to the digital experience, and often digital gets it, it, it's used synonymously for multiple things, and I, I, I want to kind of de define this before we dive in. So often, um, when we talk about digital, from our perspective, from our program perspective, we're talking about in two ways. The first way is actually we want to digitize services end to end. So that is the front end in terms of how a customer may, um, you know, want to transact or engage with the city, but also on the back end in terms of how, how we um, administer that service or deliver that service. And so what we really want to do is drive a digital sort of government sort of experience. And that would be kind of the foundations of what we want to deliver. Now, in terms of how the public interacts with us, well, that will be through various channels, right? 
that would include digital. But we I, also I'm know sorry. Can you can you slow down? I'm sorry. Can you slow down? Um, sure. We can't sure, keep sure. up with you. Sure. Sure. Um, so, in terms of the public engaging with the city, um, if we're able to digitize our services end to end, there's also opportunities to then reimagine the in-person experience and the phone channel as well. So, digital is has opportunities to kind of open up uh, um, the experience in all the different channels that we have. So, the city is determined to provide a modern and integrated customer experience using an outside-in approach. Um, and we want digital to be simple, convenient, personalized, engaging, uh, and be a channel choice with the following sort of features. So, remember me. It can be single, easy to use, secure signing and profile. Inform me. Proactive reminders for bill payments, waste calendars, classes, um, and it'll be making life easier. So, more digital payment options. Um, and also keep you engaged and bring you closer to your community, such as relevant news, community resources, and civic engagement. And so we feel that the digital component really brings multiple uh, channels uh, to the forefront. And so an individual with disability can choose the one that's most suited to their needs. Um, and then digital channel availability also allows customers with technology devices to access services where and when they want. Um, I will kind of skip over and, and go to the next piece, which is the new virtual experience. Um, so the, we, we're, we're running a, a, a eight pilots at the city currently. So the virtual caseworker is a pilot project by divisions within the community and social services to test a virtual interface to improve access to services. The intention is to expand this project beyond community and social, social services over time. So what it does is it provides service uh, provides users of a various city administered income and support programs with an option to connect virtually with city staff, for example, a caseworker, supported by a visual interface like we are today, WebEx. So it enables service users with different levels of technology skills to access a virtual caseworker by providing self service, uh, example, using their own device or facilitated service options meaning the pilot is equipping a variety of city spaces to expand uh, access to a virtual caseworker and focusing on vulnerable people and communities. Alternatively, the public can also connect using their personal devices, mitigating travel requirements or difficulties. The virtual platform allows people with disabilities to see their caseworker, read lips, and use facial expression and body cues to help understand language, tone, and meaning. Additionally, the technology supports closed captioning. These align with the client focus of sort of objectives, improve access to services by introducing additional or alternative service channels, improve digital capacity, and improve service experience and reduce client costs associated with attending in-person appointments or service captures, i.e. transportation, childcare, and so forth. There are currently eight pilots across four divisions and they're expected to be completed by the end of March 2021. So we see this as an opportunity to scale virtual services across the city for later this year and for eventual reopening, especially for services required, requiring person-to-person -person interaction, more fluid support and guidance, and to maintain ongoing service relationships. And in and, and the last two slides, um, in terms of, and it, it's related to some of the, the points that were brought up earlier in, um, in, in this meeting. So we as a program are, are in our early days. So we kind of think of our program as you go from crawl to walk to run to fly. And so we are very much in our infancy and are looking forward to kind of continuing the engagement with this committee. Um, and so, so what we, and, and that engagement is absolutely critical because we need to understand the current divide between digital channels and users. Right, and so that is to review jurisdictional data in current programs. Um, what does success look like? What type of information is gathered? Uh, we need to learn from advocates and providers. So speak to academia, agencies, and government staff. Um, and then we need to build empathy in terms of when we go and design our services. So in-depth remote interviews with people with lived experience, so we can actually co-create and develop the services with them. And so as part of our journey. Um, we're hoping that this won't be the, the first and last time that we come in front of this committee, because I think we're definitely going to need your feedback as we go and try to reimagine service delivery at the city. And I will conclude in terms of moving forward and some of the challenges our program is, is, is seeking to address. So, number one is inclusive human centered design and to take a much more deliberate approach here. 
so that established fluid working level engagement with people with disabilities, and also securing designers with inclusion and targeted universalism experience to con contribute to future design. Also, I, I believe Wendy brought this, uh, uh, the, the data question up with respect to, I believe it's FairPass and, and, and the poverty reduction strategy, and our program is, is, is seeing similar challenges. So we want to improve the complaints and this aggregated data. So right now, the, the current complaints process is something that we're targeting to improve so we can initiate an, an overhaul in, in public transparency to help further improve our service delivery. So we need to understand what type of complaints we're getting and understanding what, what people with disability are facing so we can, in real time, so we can target those complaints and then actually iteratively improve our services. And then lastly, iterative improvement process to reach our outcome. So to match the speed in which the public expects improvement, we will need to begin piloting solutions to enhance universal service delivery. So that means to utilize iterative processes to achieve new standards, accessibility, inclusion, targeted universalism, and enhance customer experience. So we will need to start doing a lot more pilots just to get things out there, and then working with our core groups to iteratively improve those services as, as we go. So that, that, that is a, a, an approach to really uh, manage the push-pull in terms of the changing world and getting services out there uh, 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 digitally very quickly, but also making sure that they're accessible and, and have a good customer experience. I'm going to pause there, Councillor. Um, I do have my colleagues here, um, Asim, Marco, Gary, Stephanie, so forth. If you guys have any, uh, if you want to add anything, if I missed any sort of key comment, and Alex as well, please jump in. Otherwise, I'll throw it back to uh, Councillor Longcamp. Great, thank you very much, Robbie. Um, thank you very much to the clerks for putting yourselves, putting the screen back on. Uh, I wanna just uh, recognize that we have, uh, we have definitely, we have some good time, but that was, a, that was a solid 25 minute presentation. So I would imagine that there might be some questions of, of our committee members. Um, but because Robbie has extended the, um, uh, I guess, extended this, the, the opportunity for presentation to his colleagues, uh, maybe I'll just indulge. Are there any members from Robbie's, Robbie's team who has anything else to add? Okay, uh, seeing none, then we'll bring it right into committee. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions of the presentation? Uh, and Wendy, thank you very much. I recognize you, you'll have five minutes. Thank you. I, I think it looks really exciting. The the plans for the actual physical space and you know the the forward thinkingness about the inclusion of people with disabilities, I think looks fantastic. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask something specific about the digital um, customer service program uh, pilot that you you were describing. Uh, and you know one just one spot that I was thinking about in the context of those kinds of um, virtual, uh, it sounds like video mediated conversations that, that the program is engaged with, uh, was around people who are deaf and who use uh, ASL as their first language. And I just wondered whether there was any thinking about how to accommodate both in that program, perhaps, and also just broadly across some of the digital strategies that you've been describing and envisioning in the future, uh, how ASL could be uh, integrated both in the pilot and in your broader digital um, strategy in terms of the new vision of how this will work at the City of Toronto. Mr. Gary, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? Sure. Hi, it's Gary York from 311. Actually, that's that's a great question. And uh, we are looking at that because, for example, with the contact center, we do deal with people with different uh, disabilities and what have you. Um, we're looking at working with technology to actually integrate and make sure that there's options and, and, and additional channels for different folks. So what's really important is not just through the phone channel, and, and what's really important to drive through the message that we're, we're really trying to give is before or currently, we're in a multi-channel environment, channel environment. And what's really important about this is that integrated service and interoperability, which means you choose how you want to communicate and be communicated back for. That, that means different methods of communication and languages as well. So we're taking that into account in our approach, 100%. Uh, I'm just gonna put my clocker on. Uh, clock is on, okay, I just made a new word, clocker. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, with respect to, I mean, first of all, I agree with Wendy. Uh, all of this work look, looks very encouraging. And of course, uh, I have, I've been aware of some of this work that's been in development. Um, but can you give us a timeline? Like, what what would you say in terms of a hard timeline that 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 our our house of government will be fully accessible? Are you aiming for 2025? Is it something that I believe, and I know Marco can probably speak more to this, but I know a lot, there's a lot of guidelines and standards already on the digital side. And of course, the capital program and the AODA. Our plans in terms of taking that beyond AODA, that it's, it's very much counts a multi-year journey. Um, and so right now, in terms of timelines, we're really focusing on a little bit of the now in terms of getting our facilities reopened in terms of the counters, digitizing some key services very quickly to get up there. But the more sort of visionary sort of integrated experience, universal design, um, the in-person experience as we describe it is very much probably three to five plus years uh, away. It'll be a journey. So it's not something I think we can all do at once but it'll be kind of a phase and we start putting the building blocks and components in uh, a one by one. So I would say it's definitely three to five years plus and it'll definitely kind of be more of a journey journey to that to that stage. Okay, uh, Robbie, thank you. That was my question. I see a hand from Michael McNeely. Michael, go ahead, please. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, thanks to my friend, Wendy, when we could expect to see some of the videos with ASL interpretation um, applied to them, maybe we could all watch a video as a committee just to give feedback. Is uh, from the team, I, is, 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 is Marco or Gary, anyone able to kind of answer the ASL question? I do know from the, the virtual service perspective, the, we, we are some running some pilots. And I think when we talk about iteration, that may be a, a, another piece that maybe Alice and team, we can kind of take away in terms of opportunities to kind of add the re remote ASL component, um, which then even make that, that sort of uh, pilot in that sort of service channel even more um, accessible. Um, but in terms of other other services that we provide, um, I, I'm not sure that's maybe a question that we may not have to kind of take away, um, Councillor and Michael, and kind of come back with much more of a clearer answer. It, 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 based on this discussion, it seems to be a bit of a, a gap, and I think that's something that we're going to have to take away and probably investigate a little bit more. Okay, um, Councillor, can you put a timeline on this, please? And um, the committee will be here to watch the video once it's ready. We can even do it on our own time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else with questions of staff? Okay. Seeing none, members to speak? Okay. Um, I will just uh, quick put my clock on. There's the timer. I just want to convey my, my personal thanks to staff for your work um, and also to move the, uh, the item for receipt. Um, you know, it's, it's been 10 years, my, my time now in this building has been 10 years, uh, and during those 10 years I've seen, um, number one, the, the thinking of, of the Toronto Public Service evolve, um, and including my own, to be quite honest, is that there have been uh, many occasions where I've run into members of the public who are trying to find their way and navigate, navigate their way through the physical facility and then running into one obstacle or another. And as uh, oftentimes as able-bodied people, uh, we just take things for granted. Uh, so something as simple as making a deputation at the committee rooms, uh, we were not necessarily able to even bring a microphone, a handheld microphone, to someone so that they can speak to the committee and be heard properly. Um, and uh, so I know that we still have a long ways to go because although we made a, a, a movable desk and I want to thank the, the staff for, for moving on that very quickly once it was identified, uh, we still don't have, I believe, all the essential changes uh, and clearly the staff presentation uh, confirms that, but not all the physical changes are, are there. But on top of the physical changes, not just in this particular um, uh, building, and I'm, right now I'm speaking to you from City Hall, but all the city facilities have got to, to uh, improve its accessibility. So therefore, you know, wh regardless of where people are, where the residents of Toronto are and how they want to interface with, with, with their city government, at the different civic centres, at the different facilities, we need to do a much better job of ensuring that, uh, number one, we do meet the, the AODA's 2025 time 
timeline. And, uh, and there are many days I, I'm so grateful that we have this, this timeline. I know many, many businesses will not meet those timelines. I'm aware that many uh, other government facilities will not meet those timelines. But I want to make sure that we at the City of Toronto do everything we can to, to bend over backwards and work 24-7 to make sure those timelines are met. Because uh, the last thing I want to see is uh, for us to approach that timeline rapidly and, and throw up our hands and say, well, we need more time. Um, and, uh, and that tells me that we didn't do enough, we didn't do it fast enough, uh, and we have to dig deeper. The, the other piece I, I think might be worth speaking to is um, there, there's the physical built form, which seems to be, uh, for many of us, the easy ones to, to identify. But there's other barriers to accessibility that I don't think we've actually um, spent a lot of time talking about. And I do recognize that city staff are doing the best that they can to grapple with how to communicate uh, to everyone in the appropriate languages that they need to, how to ensure that staff are trained to receive someone coming to the counter uh, that may be, um, uh, that may have a different communication style. Uh, and, and we need to be able to, 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 to make sure that not only do we have a plan to get that rolling, but that the plan has got to be implemented in a way that's quick but that can be measured. So that customer satisfaction and customer uh, and the surveying of the customer experience can then guide our work moving forward. Because it's not good enough that we built a, a, a desk that can rise so that a microphone can, uh, that a wheelchair can slip under that desk, but the fact that there may be some folks who just need a different type of accommodation. So I'll, I'll leave that with that. Um, I'll leave staff with those those thoughts, um, but also to recognize that I know you're working really hard. Um, but we're, this committee is going to ask you to dig deeper and to move faster. Um, and uh, three to five years for the full implementation and, and universal design achievement of, uh, of of our facilities and services, I think, is too long. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I see your hand, Michael. Please go ahead. You have five minutes. Hi, yes, um, I think I would just like to remind the presenters that um, the banisters outside also need some attention. I fell down a few years ago and I kept myself, as Kristen one time probably remembers all too well. Um, I think what's happening is that the banister ends, if it hasn't been fixed since the last time I was in City Hall, the banister ends just as soon as the step ends. Usually, then it's to be a bit more transition for the banister. So I would, I would recommend just looking at all of them. I would recommend taping down or at least painting the steps so that they're more visible. I just wanted to mention that because I think it's relevant to your presentation. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. Anyone else to speak? Uh, with that, we have the uh, motion on the floor to receive the presentation. All those in favor, uh, please indicate your support. Any contrary minded, that carries. Uh, thank you very much, staff, for the presentation. We appreciate all your hard work. We are moving on to item number five, and this is our last item. Um, and Becky, thank you very much for your patience. I know you've been hanging on. Um, active TO Midtown Temporary Complete Street Pilot, and uh, we have Becky Katz. Uh, from uh, Cycling and Pedestrian Projects, and she's here to provide us with a presentation. Thanks, it's actually a true, true pleasure to be able to sit through the whole meeting actually and, and hear about from all the other city staff that I don't always get to interact with. Um, so uh, I'm Becky Katz, I'm the manager of the Cycling and Pedestrian Projects group in um, transportation services. I've recently presented to all of y'all, so it's really nice to be back and, um, uh, you know, I, I just joined the city in September 2019, so um, I'm hoping that you'll be seeing my face uh, much more regularly um, and more proactively, not just by uh, motions that encourage me to come. So uh, this is uh, one of those times where uh, proactive um, engagement has started. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start. I'm sharing my screen right now. And um, so my, my team oversees the, the, the consultation design and delivery of um, pedestrian related projects, mostly sidewalk related projects, new sidewalks and um, cycling infrastructure, including trails, on street, bikeways, et cetera. 
And I'm actually here to um, discuss um, an upcoming project that actually does not even yet have council approval. So we're really trying to start early um, and kick off this season right with, with all of y'all. So um, I, I'm just gonna go through some background, talk about the specific project, and then I have some specific questions actually to all of you for feedback, um, along with um, encouraging all of you to give us feedback as you see fit. So, um, as you know, last year um, at the start of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there's been a lot of what I call the TO programs, um, all many of them that transformed um, the way we utilize our streets. Um, so that included active TO, which was the major road closures uh, that were weekend closures, the quiet streets program, which was temporary traffic calming on local streets and the expansion of the cycling network. There was curb TO, which um, included pickup drop off areas for people uh, doing deliveries and pedestrian queuing areas. Rapid TO, where a new bus lane, bus only lane was added on Eglinton, Kingston, and Morningside in Scarborough, and Cafe TO program. Today, I'm really actually focused on the active TO program, uh, which has a mixture of Cafe TO program. And I know the Cafe TO program has also come to present. Um, I can hopefully take any questions further about Cafe TO, but I'm not the most knowledgeable about the program, and I can always bring it back to my colleagues. So a lot of the goals of the COVID response uh, in the transportation space was uh, focused on supporting physical distancing, supporting local businesses, supporting transit system relief, uh, and then really providing a safer environment for people to move with depressed values of uh, people driving. We saw speeds go up um, and uh, you know just providing more space for people to move around safely. As part of that goals, that's how the Cafe TO program uh, came about. Uh, you know, indoor dining um, has been mostly banned, um, not allowed since since last year. There have been some moments, but even if so, the, the number of people allowed in a restaurant have been reduced. Um, and so the cafe program was really focused on the support of local business. Um, and has a variety of um, accessibility guidelines, uh, which I believe uh, has been greatly enhanced by everyone on the call's feedback today. Um, the, the other elements of the Cafe TO program and uh, some of the other, and the Active TO program um, was uh, patios next to bikeways. Uh, so the curb lane patio. So on the screen is two photos of um, Danforth Avenue, both showing a curb lane patio um, adjacent to a bike lane. So, um, you know, both the accessibility learnings of, of bikeway design and the patio design um, have to be incorporated. Also, um, there's been a long discussion about bikeway design and accessibility, uh, you know, particularly our bikeway projects that are quick build. So using paint and posts and uh, affixed materials to the asphalt um, can create um, accessibility challenges where people have uh, typically accessed the curb um, to load and unload. And we have over time, um, you know, through your feedback incorporated new additions um, Generally, the, the feedback that we get from people who cycle, particularly those who cycle with children, um, those who uh, are not confident um, cyclists, you know, that they do ask for protection. And we have experimented with many different types of protection. Um, and that's included curbs. Uh, so there's, there's a picture on the left with concrete curbs with uh, flexible bollards that are unmounted on them. Just uh, the middle picture is just flexible bollards um, uh, affixed to the roadway. And then we've used things like planters. Generally, our team has started to prefer the concrete curbs with flexible bollards, but uh, always, always happy to try out new things. The other big change in our program, well, it's not been a change, but the acceleration of our program has been doing a lot of pilots. So 
Um, a pilot project means that we're installing it for, uh, you know, typically 12 to 18 months, testing it out, making changes after installation of, of any street changes. Um, you know, they, the pilots have been very focused on cycling, but of course there's been other examples like the King Street uh, transit corridor pilot as well, where temporary materials were utilized um, to create the changes on King Street. Um, you know, pilot projects have a lot of benefits, but there are drawbacks as well. Um, you know, the benefits are it keeps us flexible, um, but you know, there there are drawbacks because we can't. Our pallet of materials are not as extensive. We're not moving curbs. Um, you know, we're not adding new signals, um, and so we do recognize that uh, they're not perfect uh, and they don't accommodate every element that we would like to accommodate in some of our projects. A little background on the cycling network plan. So the cycling network plan was adopted in 2019 and it guides my team's work. Um, part of that plan that was adopted was to do a corridor study of the Midtown North South arterials, including Avenue Road, Mount Pleasant and Young Street. And then actually in 2020, uh, we in October, we received council direction to um, not only study Avenue Road, Mount Pleasant, and Young Street for a complete streets uh, pilot or project, um, uh, sorry, for a study which was identified in the cycling network plan, we were actually asked to see if we could accelerate an implementation on one of these corridors. So this happened in October, um, and uh, this was all combined with the active TO program so that that motion specifically called to the Danforth project um, and just the general active TO program. I also came and presented uh, several months ago about the active TO program and some of the accessibility elements. And I've just re reiterated that slide here, which we looked at um, creating new access through the program, um, reducing sidewalk riding, uh, you know, to keep the pedestrian clearway open. We looked at different um, formal and informal loading areas, accessible loading areas, raised accessible platforms, uh, creating, uh, reducing or eliminating barriers near transit stops, and then doing multilingual um, education and, and outreach. So through those motions, and so through the cycling network plan, through the council motion, and through our learnings from the active TO program last year, we have engaged on a corridor study of Avenue Road, Young Street, and Mount Pleasant uh, between Lawrence Avenue and Bloor Street. So it's a quite a long length. It's uh, downtown to midtown. Um, we also included Duplex Avenue uh, from uh, Chaplin Crescent to Lawrence because it runs directly parallel to Young Street. So we have completed that corridor um, comparison finding and in accordance to the motion, what they asked us to evaluate, it has been identified that Young Street performs the best overall in terms of receiving some sort of active TO Danforth like complete streets pilot for a number of reasons. All corridors had merit, um, but the Young Street particularly performed well because um, it had the most BIAs along it. So the most amount of business frontage, uh, which could uh, you know benefit from uh, you know, uh, improve streetscaping and calming cars. Um, it has the most requests for cafe TO. So already a lot of the curb lanes would be uh, utilized for cafe space. Um, it has the highest uh, collision rate, um, particularly compared to volume. So the 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 volumes are lower on Young than Avenue and Mount Pleasant, but it actually has more collisions um, and more serious collisions involving people walking and people cycling. Um, it also performed best in the cycling category. It has the least topography, so it's not as steep um, and uh, connects um, many more uh, people to jobs and to um, grocery stores and parks. Um, 
and yeah, it just, it just came out there. But again, we believe that all three corridors had a certain level of merit, but just in terms of being asked to compare them, this is what the findings were. So with that, we have started to engage on on the second part of the motion. So the first part of the motion from council was evaluate these three corridors and let us know which one has the most merit um, and then implement something in 2021 in a very, in very short order. So we have started to pull together some elements of design. Um, so the first thing we've done is engaged with TTC and wheels trans. What you're seeing on the screen is an actual map of wheel trans trips um, and their data. Um, there's a particularly high um, uh, drop offs in um, the Bloor Yorkville BIA, um, mostly actually aligned. I wish I had put the TTC stations. Many of them are aligned with the actual TTC stations. Um, so near near Davisville, um, near St. Clair, um, and and just uh, south of church. So, um, you know, we are, we wanted to look at this to ensure that any design of a project to do a complete streets approach on Young Street um, does not make it harder or less accessible. Um, the other things that we're starting to explore um, if this project were to move forward is how the accessibility features, um, as previously discussed in the active TO presentation. So uh, some of those features that we're looking at are uh, the addition of cycle tracks that are separated from the sidewalk to reduce sidewalk riding. I think on Young Street, we we have had reports that it's specifically challenging. Um, the, some of the sidewalk right of way is narrow. It is a high, already a fairly highly ridden street. Um, and then we're looking at the barrier placement. So that actual physical separation from the travel lane and the bike lane um, and making uh, ensure that those uh, concrete barriers that we prefer um, are spaced well and um, don't eliminate access. Um, looking at vertical elements like posts and reflective strips so that they're visible. Um, again, looking at informal loading at corners, um, accessible loading uh, zones, including raised platforms and asphalt ramps um, at cafe TO uh, locations or at other areas where maybe an accessible flat ramp doesn't work um, and no barriers at uh, any sort of wheel high use wheel trans stops or bus stops. And also Young Street doesn't have parking across the whole corridor right now. Um, and uh, so the addition of actual new parking and loading areas. Um, we're also looking at new ped crossings, um, how to the pedestrian crossings. Uh, so adding curb extensions, adding new crossings, refreshing all the markings along the corridor um, and ensuring that the actual sidewalk remains clear um, of no obstructions. And then working with our partners in the Cafe TO program. Uh, here, I just have some pictures of some of those features that we did on Danforth. So this is a picture of the float. There's a, a sidewalk, a bike lane, and then parking. Um, and uh, typically we would put a barrier between the parking and the, the um, sidewalk uh, and the, the, the sidewalk and bike lane, but we have left it out for easier access to the curb. Um, in some locations, we also have installed um, asphalt ramps so that people can can move um, easily onto the sidewalk. Uh, we experimented with these for the first time. So we actually raised part of um, the bike lane um, on university. So the picture here is actually um, a sidewalk and then a raised bike lane and then parking so that people can load directly from the bikeway directly onto the sidewalk with no elevation change. Um, here's the same configuration, but actually at a transit stop. So again, a bus would pull up in the travel lane next to the bike lane um, and then load in the bike load in and out of the bike lane and people cycling have to yield. This is similar to like Sherbourne or Roncesvalles um, and a variety of other ones. It's just using temporary asphalt and not the permanent materials we would use like concrete. 
Um, also on Danforth Avenue, we did decorative curb extension. So we actually um, reduced the width of the travel lanes and added decorative markings. Um, we've never done this before. Um, and so we did ask uh, folks what their experience were with these. Um, Right now, we haven't gotten a substantial amount of feedback, though, of whether these actually help, hurt, make it more confusing, particularly those for low to no vision, um, but something that we continue to explore. So, where are we? Um, I'm, I'm a little bit over time and I want to make sure. So, right now, again, we were asked to explore comparing Avenue Road, Mount Pleasant, and Young Street. Our findings said, that Young Street would be the best if we were going to move forward with a complete streets um, pilot. To date, we have made a recommendation to council that has going to council actually next week to say that we would like to move forward with the implementation of a complete streets pilot on Young Street, actually between Bloor and Davisville. And um, to do that, we have started to initiate public consultation. So we to date have met with the BIAs um, and some key neighborhood stakeholders. And this is another point of our initial engagement. Um, and we want to, we are planning more engagement, which is why I'm here today to also talk about that. Um, and uh, we want, uh, so if, if council were to approve next week, um, the next round of engagement would be involving site visits as long as we're able to, um, given the evolving public health um, guidance from on the Ontario government. Um, so right now we're doing, we're planning to do a wheel trans tour um, to really dive into the particularities of the corridor. Um, but we want to know from all of y'all if there's others that other things that we should do on the corridor that are like site visits or others we should invite um, if it if we were uh, be allowed to. Um, any sort of design feedback before again, we have not really deeply launched into the design besides, you know, our previous um, experience designing bikeways and just general other engagement recommendations that you have of, of key people to keep in the loop um on you know or or that we should or other types of engagement that we should plan so i think that's it for me um sorry if i went a little faster wasn't um detailed enough lots of information though thank you very much becky um i thought your pace was just uh, quite right so thank you um and uh, you are a little bit over time but i think you had a lot of information to uh, to parse out um, I will just turn now to the committee members to see if they have any questions of you in your presentation, starting with Wendy. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Becky, for the presentation. Um, I wondered about uh, what is being proposed in terms of, of the Young Street pilot. So uh, you talked about a number of different options in terms of the, the bollards and the kind of um, separation indicators. Uh, and also, I'm I'm just wondering about what happens in those instances because I I saw that you had a um, done some work in terms of where are people frequently dropped off, where are people less frequently dropped off in terms of wheel trans. But what happens in the instance of somebody wanting to go somewhere that is not a frequent drop off point? I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Thank thanks for that question. It's a great one. So right now we're considering an implementation on Young Street between Davisville and Bloor that would include cycle tracks on either side uh, adjacent to the sidewalk. And then the, the corridor width actually changes on Young. So in some sections, there would be cafes and loading only on one side. So more similar to Bloor West, um, if you've uh, driven, walked or, or ridden through um, like, uh, uh, like Bloor Court or Bloor Dale, so kind of the, the core, more narrow section. In some sections, we're actually able to accommodate parking and loading or cafes on both sides, mostly in the northern segment. So we are looking to create um, formal 
high priority loading areas, uh, particularly near TTC stops uh, or, or TTC stations in this situation, um, along with you know popular uh, destinations or clinics. But we do acknowledge that lots of folks have to go lots of places that you know are much more disseminated. So some of the strategies we're pursuing is um, actually adding parking on the corridor. In some locations, there's no parking or loading at all. So, for example, like near the cemetery. Um, so actually looking for new new locations, um, improving side street access. Um, and ensuring that there are clear loading um, areas um, on side streets. Young Street has a very nice, dense network of local streets, um, so that could help. And then looking at crossings, uh, creating safer crossings so that if one side uh, doesn't allow for loading or a section of street doesn't allow for loading, to ensure that there's um, excellent crossing opportunities for people walking. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think those are probably some of the main efforts, but yes, some areas would not any longer allow curbside loading, which, uh, you know, we try and mitigate through the measures I just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wendy. Anyone else with questions for Becky? Uh, Becky, I recognize that your last slide was uh, was really to prompt our thinking. Um, and if I can just ask you to perhaps put that slide back onto the screen, because you're asking this committee a, a, a few specific questions, and I think you hope to leave this presentation room uh, with a few answers. So I guess uh, with respect to site visits and, and you wanting to know whether or not there's anybody that your team should invite on the tour, um, is it possible for you to provide this committee a list of who you already have as invitees? Because that might be easier than us randomly tossing out names. Um, and we could provide this sure. to you. Uh, if you can provide this to us even after the committee meeting, uh, committee members can then respond to you directly. Um, and I would say the same thing with respect to um, design considerations. Are you looking for just sort of general comments? Because I think we we saw some general images, but are you are you looking for something specific? Like if there's a specific um, uh, sort of intervention that you've applied onto the road that you want to get some specific feedback on, that might help um, us understand what it is you're looking for. Yeah, so I, I think because I've, I'm so new at the city, um, I am looking for general feedback, you know, specific, uh, gen general specific, I just said, uh, <laughs> general specific issues that the committee or your network faces when we install new bikeways. This is not our first uh, pilot project and it's um, definitely something that uh, I have received feedback from, from y'all from my previous discussions. But if there's anything that you really want to highlight to us before we go into the detailed design process. So again, we have no designs yet, but when we do, we will be asking for specific feedback. The one element that um, we'd love some feedback if, if there were is on the, the decorative curb extensions on the Danforth project um, where you know, we've painted the road and uh, we just want to make sure that visually, because it's a lot of additional paint and um, potential noise, um, whether it actually detracts from the experience or enhances the crossing experience. Um, and then, yeah, just, just general uh, engagement guidance so that when we launch into a very rapid detailed design process, ensuring that we're touching base with the right people um, at the right times and not overburdening um, the, the committee. Okay, Becky, th thank you, that's very helpful. Can I ask, um, and I probably should know this answer, but for some odd reason I don't. Like I know, for example, PFR uh, has a group of, uh, of, of citizen experts, um, mostly people living with disabilities and other lived experiences and, and advocates on their behalf who they can actually um, uh, go to when they need to have them review a detailed uh, plan or a drawing, whether it's a new playground or, or a multi-use trail. Um, 
within a park uh, within a park and ravine uh, setting does transportation service have that same uh, a group of those citizens that they can draw expertise from because you're also looking for very technical feedback yeah so uh, again we're looking for the the whole range from you know just engagement uh, making sure y'all are in the know um, which was also requested through a motion um, about active to so I, I wanted to come early i believe we do have that committee but it perhaps has not been active or very active over the past few years so i, I have to check in with my colleagues who've been at the city longer but i do believe um, that 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 group of folks for transportation services does exist and we have been um, looking to re-engage them specifically in this project because um, it is quite an important project and with the subway access I think is particularly sensitive to ensure that we do not reduce or make it harder for people to move around on the corridor. Okay, so Becky, I guess um, to, to answer your question regarding the decorative curb extensions, and I recognize that this is the, this is the, the sort of the graphic paint images that we, we, you showed us on the screen. Um, I, I, obviously, I, I, I think, you know, and this is very antidotal. So um, as, as someone who has friends and, and people in my life who I love and care for very deeply, who have um, various uh, stages of low vision, um, I, I would imagine that this some, something like this, they, they, it might be confusing to them, to be quite honest, because I've seen that there are times where they, they may not, there's the illusion of where the, the sidewalk begins and ends. Uh, the only thing I would offer you is that that, com that community probably needs to have deeper engagement, uh, whether it's you contacting the CNIB uh, and other uh, groups that advocate for, for those who have the, the low vision or even visual impairments. Um, that would be, uh, I think, critical. Um, and, and sometimes I would just offer you this. Um, whether it's a visual cue to, to those who are sighted so that they know that they can step into that space and that it's not for vehicles, uh, obviously there's a very clear functionality intended. Um, but then there's also the general aesthetic. Like if something does not impede anyone's access or anyone's mobility, but it actually is just beautiful to look at or beautiful to experience as, as someone who's actually standing in the space. Maybe if you can think about how to evaluate between the two, because um, I know that you're trying to create that extension, uh, that, that sidewalk extension, but it's still, it's still not a flush uh, surface. So therefore someone is still stepping down into it and it doesn't take a lot to trip up. Um, so I, I think if there was, you know, one beautiful uh, universally acceptable graphic design that could be modified a little bit as you move from space to space. There, therefore, it's a universal cue there, and, and we have all then become trained to know what it means. Uh, no different than perhaps some of the, the way we now see a yellow line on a street. That yellow line on the street tells me that that's where bi-directional traffic is, is intended to go and we all understand that. Um, so I, I would just offer you perhaps, you know, that type of feedback. It may not be the best technical feedback, uh, but it's uh, it's something that I know I've experienced when I've when I've been moving around the city with my friends uh, who who do actually live with low vision and and they use a cane. Okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, any other questions for uh, for Becky? Okay, Michael, I recognize you. Please go ahead. You have five minutes. Hi, um, as a friend of the councillors, I would also agree with what she is saying. Um, as a person who is low fishing myself, a person who struggles with balance issues, um, I would also add that looking at the design is also um, a cause for concern because if I'm looking at the design, I'm not moving, I'm not, um, I'm not paying attention to what's going on around me. If there was a crowd, it could uh, be potentially dangerous for me to look at the pattern and try and figure out where to go and how to navigate it. Um, I would also indicate that um, because of the sidewalk conditions in the city, some sidewalks are more sloping than others, and sometimes it feels like there's no curb, but there's actually a curb, and all those kinds of things can get can get in the way of walking and navigating safely. 
So I want, in addition to what Preston has mentioned to you, I would also think about um, how to alert people more, um, more city-wide about various changes that are happening. So how can you tell the people who are blind or who have low vision that there is something that's changed and how can they know about it? So that would be something I would want to say going ahead in your communication plan. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, thank you. I recognize Glenn, Glenn to, to ask questions. Um, sure, just, um, well, it's question time, so I'll pose it as a question, but it's kind of a suggestion. Uh, wondering if the same sort of thing that they use in TTC or in some other spaces where there's a change of elevation, where there's the, the yellow tape with the little bumps, um, so even if one were to keep the color, you know, where there's the design element, you would, there would be that change of elevation. I call them speed bumps, but you know what I mean? And with the yellow, that bright yellow has sort of become a universal indicator of something like a change of elevation or warning to stop because there's a drop. Um, maybe something like that could be implemented where there's a something like that where it's appropriate. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is a direct answer, but I think some of the pieces that we're looking to improve on our quick builds is um, upgrading to add the tactile plates um, as part of our, our quick build portfolio, which hasn't always been true when we built bike lanes. We didn't always also upgrade um, those elements. So. I think that's a great a great suggestion as and as we try and level up our designs, um, I think that's that's absolutely something necessary for us to consider. I should also say that uh, when we installed the Danforth project, we were able because of the public health guidelines to do public intercept surveys. Um, as part of those public intercept surveys, we specifically tried to capture user experiences of people living with uh, various disabilities. Um, and we were able to get direct feedback from people moving along Danforth. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm also happy to provide a summary of some of that feedback um, in future discussions together. Um, but that's also will help us inform this and one of Glenn, just to your point, some of that feedback was about can't the intersections be further upgraded for um, the tactile plates or the yellow strips um, so that when these changes come in place, it's better for everybody, not just for a specific set of users. Uh, thank you very much for that exchange. That was very helpful. Um, anyone else? Okay, uh, those to speak. Okay, uh, Wendy, I'll start with you and then followed by Michelle. Wendy first. Uh, thanks again, Becky. I just, you know, in terms of your questions, I think then uh, Councillor Wong Tam is suggesting that perhaps you, there can be a way to email committee members and we can get back to you. And that, certainly I think there's a few agencies that um, it would be good to connect you with. Um, in the city of Toronto and, and folks who have expertise in understanding how people with disabilities navigate the city, right, in particular. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize as a, a kind of general principle too, that people with lived experience be a critical part of the, of the outreach that you do and of the engagement that you do around how is this gonna work and what does it look like? And because I think sometimes what happens is we, we see people speaking on behalf of the community, right? And when that happens, there's almost always something lost in translation. So, you know, my question earlier about what happens in those instances where people wanna go somewhere that's not considered a high frequency uh, loading zone or, you know, has, has that built into it, um, relates to thinking about people that I know with lived experience in the city who would use wheel-trans but not necessarily use a power chair. You know, so somebody with a disability who uses a walker instead, and now you know if you're if you're offloading them somewhere that's not relatively close to where they're going, now they're going to encounter issues of fatigue in terms of trying to get to where they are, right? So I think that the broader portion of folks that you can engage with that actually have lived experience it would be really helpful. And just to say thanks for being proactive and coming to see us 
I think proactive is brilliant. And uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Councillor. So, uh, just my apologies. I've wanted to contribute a lot more during this meeting, but construction noises in the background have prevented it. It seems like there's maybe a lunch break now or something, so I get to chime in. Um, but this uh, definitely extends to all of the presenters today, to anyone who is still uh, on the call. Uh, firstly, thank you, Becky. Agree with Wendy that proactive is wonderful, and we would love to see more of it. It's very refreshing. Uh, so I look forward to the list of uh, agencies that you're looking to connect with. I did just want to specify around uh, agencies like Community Living Toronto, uh, where I work, who support folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It, sometimes it's a bit of a different process. So one, certainly engaging with the agency is wonderful, but like Wendy said, you'd have to buffer in more time to ensure that you're actually hearing the voices of the people receiving our supports and services, because I do find with um, surveying staff at the agencies, yeah, a lot tends to get missed or it's just based on someone's perception of what a person with a disability is going through and they don't have that lived experience themselves. Um, and just as a lesson learned from the recovery and rebuild um, survey, it was great that we were involved, but it did take uh, time and organization to actually have um, you know folks like myself calling the people that receive our supports and services to to get their feedback and rewording the questions in ways that it would actually um, get authentic responses. So I would love to be part of that uh, consultation process and and happy to advise. But just sort of wanted to give that heads up um, that different types of accommodations would be needed. Uh, but bonus for you, our our community has a, a lot of diversity. You'll likely get. Um, lots of great feedback from folks who are wheelchair users, um, have lower no vision, um, and so forth. So just wanted to offer that. Thanks, Becky. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, if not, then I do have a quick motion I'd like to put on the screen. Um, and poor Jennifer, she just stepped away from her computer when I spoke. Um, so the, the motion, I'll, I'll just start to read it, but it will be on the screen. Um, the motion is to communicate to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee and City Council uh, its support for Active Teal Midtown Temporary Complete Street Pilot and its harmonized installation in consultation with the TTC Wheeltrans, as well as its ongoing refinements through consultation with persons living with disabilities. And to recommend that the General Manager of Transportation Services report to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee following the consultation and full installation of the active TO Midtown Temporary Complete Street Pilot. Uh, I want to thank the members of the committee uh, for your feedback and input. Uh, this motion I'm actually moving on your behalf. Um, and just to recognize that uh, Becky, you have done an incredible amount of, of work as, as everybody within your division, uh, transportation services and all the TO programs you've been actively rolling out over the past uh, 14, 14 odd months uh, has not been lost on this committee. I do recognize um, that, and I think it's important for us to mention, um, you know, the, the ongoing refinements to the programs as you roll them out. And I do want to just extend my, my thanks because I do feel, um, and I genuinely feel this, is that you folks are listening to, to this committee, uh, that you, you actively seek our, uh, our advice. And of course, uh, these committee members are very keen to offer it. Um, and by doing that up front, uh, as Wendy has said, and so has Michelle and everyone on the, on the, in the meeting today, is that doing it proactively helps us avert some of the problems afterwards. Um, and, uh, and that is a much better way to, to go about. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I know this is going to be a pretty exciting summer for Midtown. Uh, and certainly Young Street is a very beautiful and iconic street. And I think it will be very successful. Uh, for those who need to ride up that hill, I, I, I wish you all the best of luck. It is not easy, uh, and I'm not in the worst shape, but uh, I, I also know that I have seen falls, uh, so I, I've seen friends not make it as we, as we climb that hill together. Um, so if we're all going to do this, we're going to be in much better shape by the end of the year. Uh, that is for sure. Okay, so um, I have nothing further but to say thank you. Uh, any others to, to ask questions of the mover, perhaps? Seeing none, straightforward. Uh, all those in favor of the motion before us? Thank you, and that carries. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of the meeting. Just give me a second while I turn to staff. I just want to know if there's any administrative cleanup that I need to, uh, to come back with.
who do I need to excuse? Okay, so we're just going to get ready to put one more motion on the screen. Uh, there are some members who were not able to join us today, and this committee would like to uh, uh, move to excuse those who were absent. Uh, so, TAC excuse the absence of Miranda Frey, Liv Mendelson, Jason McSeely from the April 1st, uh, 2021 uh, TAC meeting. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the agenda.